Welcome, folks. I am Jabby Koi, joined by Achara Kirk. What's up? We're looking at Moon Knight Episode 5, Breakdown Easter Eggs and Details You Missed from New Rockstars. Thank you, New Rockstars, for allowing us to react to this and educate us on all things that are Moon Knight. If you guys haven't already, please hit that subscribe button, bell icon, all notifications, and pretty please vote this up to let YouTube know you're enjoying what you're watching. While you're subscribed and upvoting, subscribe to New Rockstars. If you haven't done so already, there's a link in the description below. You can click on that, give the original an upvote, and subscribe to them from there. All right, here we go, Eric Voss. Let's do it. Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Moon Knight episode five, which confirmed my underworld theory, but uh, damn, you hate to be right if it means death by sand. Let's break down this heartbreaking and mind-blowing episode yeah. shot by shot for all the details that you might have missed. And you can support New Rockstars by checking out our Tomb of the Moon God shirt. We're almost run out of these over at NewRockstarsMerch.com. Getting this shirt will unlock the added option to write in a custom shout out that will appear at the bottom uh, of the Moon Knight after show. Okay. So we open in the cave <laughs> as we hear Mark's brother no. Randall shouting. <laughs> Now, Randall is the name of Mark's brother in the comics, goes on to carry the monikers of Hatchet Man and Shadow Knight, but, um, not here. Oh. Then Mark's mother snaps at him. It's, it's all your fault! And don't forget Uncle Frank. Look I what you did, you little jerk! Oh gosh, the what a callback. Shots back. earlier this season focused on close-ups of dry sand. Of course, foreshadowing yeah. the sands they would return to this season, but now in this episode, Steven's corporeal fate. And since those sand dunes are depicted as ocean waves that the boat passes through, the drowning of Randall foreshadows the drowning of Mark's second brother that he created to help Aww. cope with the trauma of losing the first. Then we cut to this goddess of motherhood screaming, which was directly from Mark screaming mother from the mother Mark feared to a physically fearsome mother that actually ends up being the nurturing mother that they really need. You know, the ocean thing, it took me a second to process that. The comparison he was making to his brother drowning and then yeah. the ocean of sand. And, and then his second brother. Yeah, that pseudo was, brother. That was like a, a beautiful connection. It was like a haiku. Well, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Then to Harrow's office, where he has fresh wounds on his nose that Everyone's were not there. Everyone's freaking at the end of out about four. this one. Now, later, Harrow does deny sedating him, so there is definitely off the books violence with the orderlies mm -hmm. here. But notice that bandage. Now, Mark does have one of these when he talks to Konshu in the comics that this is based on, but this is also the kind of bandage that you would see on a boxer's broken nose, and Mark in the comics was also a boxer. Oh, shit. I bring all this up because there is still the unseen Jake Lockley altar, the this fiercest is what of the three. Everyone was we freaking out about rattling like a boxer itching to get into the ring, but is he unseen? Because this altar in this scene seems way more tense and way more confused whenever Harrow calls him Mark. And Oscar Isaac is definitely making different vocal choices here. You're not a doctor. They must pay you a lot of yeah. money in this place. You know You're what? really good. They must pay you a lot of money in this place. I'm sorry. Look, this episode started from the low angle point of view of that mom just before she was going to hit him. Once a person had pointed out that when he's in the street drinking, his voice is also different. There's a deeper accent there. I didn't pick I up didn't on that. I didn't pick up on but that. But I just saw a comment that mentioned that. I definitely noticed it. Especially in, when he pointed it out, yeah. Yeah, in this scene, as we were watching it, I did kind of notice it, but I kind of went, oh, well, maybe I just never really noticed his very New York accent. My brain kind of went, oh, that's weird. But then I was like, oh no, moving on with the story. Do you right. know what I mean? You just get wrapped up in the next thing. Started from the low angle point of view of that mom just before she was going to hit him, which might mean that in addition to creating the altar of Stephen Grant on that day, they also might have created the altar of Jake Lockley in that moment to actually take the abuse, which might have led to Jake's mm. extreme violence. So in total, Jake to take the punches, Stephen to think he had a loving mom, and Mark to live with the guilt of it all. So within the subjective afterlife aboard this ship, Mark's organizing principle also created this inner office to represent his self-doubt. So it may be Jake in here, and either way, Jake is left in this psych ward, meaning he still has a chance to reconnect with Khonshu to rescue the others. Then again, in the next scene, Mark retains what Harrow said about organizing principles, so it's not totally clear. Hey, by the way, New Rockstars is launching a new daily live stream starting Monday called The Break Room, where those yuckos down at New Rockstars HQ are gonna react to these boss hot takes while interacting with you live. Give it a go for it, it's gonna be fun. Harrow says your brain is a pendulum swinging between a very difficult reality that you are my patient here at Putnam Medical Facility in Chicago Illinois and a reassuring fantasy 
that you've created on your own. Yes, again, the image of the brain swinging like a pendulum, sense, nonsense, parallels the scales of justice and the way Harrow's right. staff and the lanterns yes. all swing back and forth. Also, Putnam Psychiatric Hospital is a facility in the Jeff Lemire comics where Mark's father, Elias, interns him after Mark witnessed a Nazi serial killer posing as a rabbi, witnessing this murder being the traumatic event that causes DID. So as hard as it was to watch the child abuse in this episode, definitely not as dark as that would have been. <laughs> a clock appears wow. on the back wall, just like the one in the rec room, hands also made of Khonshu's staff shape with a crescent moon tip. And like oh, that wow, one, yeah. this clock also does not actually move, but the ticking is still going and has now actually grown louder so that each tick edits the shot to a new frame. All right, you're doing everything and everything possible not to look oh, within. Yeah. And again, my favorite set detail about this is that this set in the office is the same attic set from Harrow's compound. In oh my two. God. And over white. And back in that moment, Steven said to Leila, I had oh my God. no idea. <laughs> I'm going to die on evil magician's man cave. Ah uh, yes, cave. I think they reused that set and that same fear of death and the cave trigger to <laughs> decorate to this representation of the altar's fear within the duat. Wow. Now, by the way, I love all the visual details that went into Tuaret. Her ears constantly wiggling, especially when she's a little nervous. Her blue fingernail yeah. polish, which is the same color as the paint on her chest scarab. And then this is it's awesome. Lapis In the lazuli, corner mirror baby. that is always behind her, the VFX artists always added her reflection, even showing her back when she turns. Such wow. great attention to detail here. Now she says, been a minute since we've had a soul pass through here. Which is a nod to that rift between gods and man when humans stopped believing in the Egyptian gods. And so naturally fewer people's souls over the millennia would see their afterlife as this Egyptian duat. In addition to the fun animation, I just love the characterization of this hippopotamus brought to light by Antonia Salib. Excuse me. <laughs> ah, aha, okay, here we go. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, her nervous apologies, the way she licks her lips, and then when she tries to clear her throat, it comes out like a hippopotamus <laughs> belch. That was cute. She declares, Welcome, gentle traveler, uh, travelers, to the realm of the Jewel. This is the afterlife? The afterlife? An afterlife, not the afterlife. You'd be surprised how many intersectional planes of untethered consciousness exist. Yeah. <gasps> like the ancestral plane. Oh, just gorgeous. Yes, as I interpreted, this hospital is the subjective underworld of the MCU, in this case called the Duat, much like the way T'Challa and Killmonger's perceptions of the ancestral plane took the forms of an African savanna or an Oakland apartment. And this also suggests that there are countless MCU afterlives that all take various forms. One mm -hmm. of them was likely the Soulstone way station that Thanos was transported to. I'm gonna talk about this a lot more in future videos because despite claiming not to connect too much to the MCU, Moon Knight just contributed more MCU world building than anything we saw in Hawkeye or the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Now also those lamps tilting the hallway last episode to the sounds of a creaky hole were indeed a sign that this is all aboard a vessel as we have been speculating ever since we saw all that sunken boat in Gus's fish tank. And of course, how right. Egyptian mythology depicts the underworld passage using similar boat imagery. I love how the sky of this underworld is purple, also reminiscent of the ancestral plane yeah. when T'Challa first enters it. Frozen in the sand are past guilty souls, also kind of reminding us of the scattered pruned figures of the void. The bow of this boat has a Tuaret statue and a smaller one is aboard the rudder. Tuaret and Stephen explain that oh. they are headed toward the Aru, the field of reeds, the heavenly paradise from Egyptian mythology, only accessible if their heart's weight balances with the feather of truth. To where it pulls their hearts from their chests. Another Indiana Jones reference, by the way, to the Ladoon. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Stone. Oh my God. <laughs> Damn it. That's such an obvious one too. By the way, did you notice that when they were showing the reflection up above, uh -huh. you couldn't see Mark Specter? You could see Stephen. You, you could see Stephen Grant, but no, you couldn't see Mark. I didn't notice that. I mean, at least when he kept showing the close up, I couldn't see Mark Specter. I don't know if that was an indicative of anything, but that's just, it's just something I, I clocked. I just thought maybe it was because in that field of vision, you couldn't the see them. In the way. Yeah. Maybe because Disney Plus does not want a bloody pulsing organ, but also reflects how Khonshu is currently encased in stone Ushapti form. But these scales are held by Anubis, who in Egyptian mythology is the true purveyor of justice standing before Amit, unlike Harrow's scales tattoo, which shows Amit's crock heads holding the scales. Mark suggests to kill the hippo, steal the boat, but they head back inside to try to balance their souls, each room now containing a dark memory from their past. Kind of like the memory elevator of Inception, but also mm. a lot like in WandaVision, another series that spins 
begins its penultimate episode going down memory lane. We see the museum bathroom from episode one, and across the hall from that, Steven's memory of rewinding the stars in episode three with Khonshu, that room labeled treatment room, this being the traumatic moment they lost Khonshu. That elevator the was a good third room is actually labeled with the yeah. QR code for the floor map, and when you scan this, it actually takes you to the comic issue of oh, Moon Knight number one of 1980. Oh, the wow. I didn't even see that. Of the Moon Knight character showing his origin story with Bushman. Literally, the floor map of this hospital is Mark's origin story. Mark brushes off the memory oh, from standing cool. on that street outside his mother's shiva, but Steven knows only their darkest, most unresolved moments are being kept here. And in the cafeteria are Mark's victims from his time as Khonshu's avatar, all of their canopic jars on the tables in front of them. They were criminals, oh, that's why they murderers, were, yeah. predators, that mean, the canopic worst jars. In the Egyptian burial rites, they would take out all of the internal organs and put it in the jars. Oh, gotcha. First. Yeah, thankfully the camera is not on Mark when he says predators, because I would not want to be the actor labeled predator in this episode, or ever. But also among these victims is Randall, whom Mark does still feel guilt for killing. It's interesting how Randall is able to move around, meaning that all of these other corpses are also mobile. It's just creepy to think how they're all just sitting here listening, waiting Ooh. to make their move. He didn't kill him. He, he was didn't... just responsible indirectly for his death. Well, that's the saddest thing, right? When you're a child and you do something like that, and yeah. then the adult in your life who you love, you take their word as the truth. When they come at you and they say, it's all your fault, you killed your brother, you can't help but be conditioned by what they're telling you. You internalize that blame and that belief, and then it becomes your belief when that's not true. And that's why I love the moment when at the end, uh, Steven's like, it, it wasn't your fault, you were a child. I was like, Steven follows Roro to the memory of the barbecue with her mother, Wendy, and their father, Elias. Come check out my drawing. He drew the fish with only one fin. Mark, be nice to your little brother. Yeah, I love the blocking with Oscar Isaac and Carlos Sanchez, who plays young Mark. Incredible performances from both of them this episode, as they both turn to look back at the mom and then back at their oh, brother, yeah. synced. Randall's drawing of the fish, of course, reflects Gus's Nemo fin, and yeah. the way poor Randall will end up unable to swim, similar to how Gus perished outside of Steven's memory as oh. Steven woke up to him just replaced. Young Mark says, Later, gators. Wild crocodile. Call back. Showing the origin of Steven's yeah. sign off with his yeah. mom. He always said that to her, but never heard her loving response. And of course, sets up Mark's showdown with the croc mouth of Onnit. Mark sure. and Randall venture into a cave, and Steven follows, stepping on Khonshu looking bird bones. That could explain why Khonshu takes a skeletal form in Mark's eyes, when in Egyptology, Khonshu has a living bird head. The brothers say, oh. I'll be right there, though. Can you hear that, Dr. Grant? I sure do, Rosa. Sounds to me like danger. Yes, Rosser is the name of Dr. Grant's young sidekick, Tomb Buster being a movie that these brothers must have watched together, and Roro being his nickname probably came from Rosser. And him doing the British accent is likely what inspired Mark to start doing that voice to escape his mom. As Steven pushes into the flooding cave, the sounds of water also play over the shots of Mark in the psych ward. But we never see the boys inside of the cave, and we never see young Mark escaping it. Yes, there are lots of rules about filming child actors in water. It's generally not a safe thing to do, but you can also interpret this metaphor Metaphorically, Mark entered Plato's I didn't know that. The cave and never came back out. He never reached true enlightenment. He just remained chained up in that cave, only able oh. to perceive reality as deceptive shadows on the wall. Mm. But then Mark enters the memory of the Shiva for his brother. Now, a Shiva is a Jewish funeral service for a close family member. And I really love that they included the detail of the mirror being covered in this green sheet because it's customary to cover mirrors in the Shiva household so that the mourners focus less on themselves and solely on the deceased. But this also reminds us oh. of Mark's partially covered covered mirror in his hotel room at the end of episode two, a shot that also prominently featured his star of David necklace. Mark tried to cover that mirror, but the sheet slid off. Throughout the series, his mirror reflection has been what's haunting him everywhere, now reflecting how he's truly unable to mourn. The staircase that Steven goes up has actually been seen in the closing credits to every episode, and now we know why. Birthday oh. after birthday, it's a powerful representation of the torment that his mother put him through. We start with Elias and Mark blowing out the candles together, but framed behind them in the middle is that wet bar with the decay canter of booze. Now Steven goes up again, oh. but just finds himself back on that same floor. Impossible to escape the cycle of abuse. And now on this birthday, the decanter is in Wendy's hand. Hey, uh, pro tip, if someone is walking around with a glass of booze in one hand and the full bottle in the other, just waiting to refill it, there is a problem. And poor teenage Mark finally just has to leave this house. Actually behind Mark in the scene is this poster showing someone falling down a hole as this whole episode shows Mark and Steven doing, descending deeper and deeper <laughs> Wow. Mark and Steven tumble on to the dig site incident. Turns out going AWOL in a fugue state gets you discharged from the military. 
I didn't have a ton of options after that, so I went work for hire for my old CEO, Bushman. Yes, referring to Raul Bushman, Mark's mercenary partner in the comics turned villain responsible for the death of Marlene's archaeologist's father, or in this case, Layla's father. Mark recounts how he tried to help this dig team escape, but ended up getting shot himself and had to crawl into the tomb of Khonshu. Now notice how the moon overhead is now in its waning crescent phase. The crescent shape, meaning Khonshu's power, is rising. We can also see this same phase of the lunar cycle in the episode five credits, which have been changing episode to episode. So oh my Mark gosh. Mark offs himself here, as we saw Jake try to do earlier with that paperweight. But Khonshu stops him. What a waste. Hmm. Huh? Now it's interesting, you could actually interpret everything that happened in Mark's life after this point as the judgment journey of a man within the moment of his suicide. Which, uh, by the way, my hot take for Liam Neeson in the gray. Think about it. Khonshu says, Your mind, I feel it. Fractured. Broken. Most fascinating. You are a worthy candidate to serve me during this time. Yes, so Khonshu didn't possess Mark in spite of his DID, but actually preys on him because of it. And there's a really quick subtle shot here. As Mark first drifts closer to death, he looks up at the statue and briefly we see Khonshu's actual hand and staff before that right. statue. Oh, yeah. Just a way of showing how Mark is already beginning to allow that deity into his heart. And Mark consents. Then rise, rise and live again. As my fist of vengeance, as my moon knight. Yes, the first and so far only time Moon Knight has been spoken on this show. Another parallel to WandaVision episode eight, which ended with Agatha saying Wanda's superhero moniker for the first time in the MCU. But that makes you the Scarlet Witch. I like how various colors flicker across Mark's face during this transformation, showing the supernatural power inhabiting his flesh, as well as giving him this cool suit. Back on the deck, baboons scatter. Now baboons actually yeah. play an important role during the duat process, carrying out Toth's duties as the god of measurement as the heart is weighed on the scales. Baboons also guard the gate of the underworld. Tuarit says, Fear is spreading in the upper world. Unbalanced souls are being judged and condemned to the sands before their time. Oh, this is bad. This is evil. Yes, souls plummet into the sand at an alarming rate, meaning Harrow must have freed Amit from her Ushapti yeah. and is now wreaking havoc on the world. I cannot wait to see this judgment process upstairs because Amit is depicted as a ferocious crock-headed beast with the front half of a lion, the back half of a hippo. Tawara and Kanchu are about 10 feet tall, but could Amit be like a freaking bus-sized oh, monster shit. pouncing through the streets of Cairo, eating anyone who smells evil? Or is Amit's judgment a remote process that opens up purple underworld portals beneath the feet of rotten egg souls like Veruca Salt. Is that what that poster behind Teenage Mark was referring to? Whatever oh. it is, it's gonna be wild. They're able to convince Tuara to steer them back toward Osiris's gate, and Steven snaps at Mark. If Layla dies, that's on your head. It'll be all your fault. No, 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 you can't! I won't do it! I won't do it! You can't save me! Yes, Steven accidentally speaks Wendy's torment words, and Mark finds himself back in Harrow's office. His face no mm. longer injured, just even more evidence that the altar in the first scene of this episode was not Mark or Steven. Here, Harrow asks the core question of the series. Do you think you created Steven to hide from all the awful things you feel you've done in your life? Or do you think Steven created Mark? to punish the world for what your mother did to you. This really is the chicken or the egg argument of the series. Who created whom? How far back did this really go? Ultimately, I think we did start with Mark. I just like how this show casts just enough doubt on the reliability of his perception. And we return to the awful day. It begins with a close-up on the table as Mark swipes the action figures of Dr. Stephen Grant and Rosser. But really, would these, like the Tomb Buster poster, truly exist as merch in the MCU for a little scene knockoff direct to VHS movie? Also, considering this is the same universe of actually real IP as Ned Flanders and The Simpsons, Finding Nemo, and both avatars. Not to mention, on the other wall of this room is the movie poster for the 1977 Star Wars. Also on Mark's side table are a pair of nunchucks and a wooden scale, showing how even in this memory, Mark and yeah. Steven Souls are still being judged. And behind Mark on the other side of that room is a Chicago Cubs banner, as well as Randall's fish drawing, oh, when we clearly saw Randall finishing coloring in the fin as orange on the day of his death. And we see the moment that young Mark first creates the Steven altar. I didn't even clock the fish thing with the yeah. rain. With the fin, rather. Bloody hell. Look at the state of this place. But it's way out before mum sees it. And folks, according to clinical research, this is how DID manifests in patients. Often a traumatic childhood memory. In this case, we learned that it was Mark 
willing into existence an alter who did not have to have this abusive woman as his mother and might instead oh, so have a mother that actually loves him. Steven notices the Tomb Buster poster tagline, when danger is near, Stephen Grant has no fear. Also in that poster, you can see the split bust of the Aztec moon deity, Koyashatki, now side-eyeing them. But the poster credits are filled with Easter eggs. Timely Atlas Studios, Timely Atlas being the original name of Marvel Comics. Doug Perlin oh. is a merging of the Moon Knight creators, Doug Monch and Don Perlin. Melissa Russell is the wife of writer Jeremy Slater. Dylan Beck is the assistant production coordinator on the show. Wyatt and Dylan Curtis, probably related to the producer Grant Curtis. Colleen Strasselowitz is the wife of Nick Pepin, whose own name cameoed back in episode two. Carmel Benson is probably related to director Justin Benson. Amy Stewart is a partner to director Aaron Moorhead. Nor Iqbal Mulvey is married to the writer Sabir Prasada. And I assume the other names are just loved ones for other staff and crew. Isn't it interesting that Stephen Grant is this character in the in the show, within the show? Yeah. Who's a very, who's this adventurous person and no one can stop him. No fear when danger is near. And yeah. yet Stephen Grant that was manifested by Mark Spector is very afraid of things. He is, but I guess in his life, there wasn't anything to really be afraid of because he had all of the nice memories and nice things. Even if he is like this mild mannered, awkward, you know, person. I just think it's kind of ironic that, yeah. you know, he, he it's manifested off of, it was the template was this character who was like Indiana Jones and yet the, the what came out was this guy who's kind of a goober. And maybe it was supposed to be inspirational. Like sure. in his mind, he's like, I want to be that guy who's right. not afraid, but clearly is afraid of everything. Ones for other staff and crew. Wendy moves in to abuse her son. But again, this must not have been Steven at the moment of the abuse, otherwise he would have remembered it. So yeah. I truly do think I that the was, alter yeah. present for all those beatings really could could have been Jake. Steven returns to Harrow's office. It's a strong argument. Oh. Diploma. This thing just says graduate. Yeah, I, I saw someone had said that in the comments to our reaction as well. They they said that perhaps Jake was the one who was created to take the beatings. Take the beatings. Gotcha. Yeah. A diploma in psychology, no university listed, no signature, only that he graduated in December 13, 2011. Yeah, it's a fake. Steven makes <laughs> another pop culture reference. It's so strange, a little haircut. Little silly Tash there. It's very Ned Flanders. Yeah, the visual totally tracks, but also <laughs> Ned Flanders is known as Springfield's dogmatically faithful true believer as Harrow is for Amit. Oh, thank God. Oh, right. That's true. Neighborino. Harrow arranges to call Stephen's mum. Hey, Dylan. Yeah, Don't could you call Mrs. Gray, please? Yes, Dylan is the name of Stephen's tour guide date. Now coming back here as a receptionist of this facility, but Stephen doesn't want the call to go through because he knows that there will be no one at the other end of that call, just as there wasn't for any of his calls, just the dial tone. Now, no call was actually made here, of course. This was just Steven finally facing his own truth. At Wendy Spector right. Shiva, Mark stands outside in front of the Watterson Food and Liquor, a nodded executive producer, Trevor Watterson. Mark walks off and collapses, smacking his yarmulke, but then cradles it. Yes, this violent act makes him see his yarmulke as his brother, that he still feels guilt for harming. And for a second, it seems like he's looking directly into Steven's eyes, but he's actually reverting into a Steven altar. Hey, uh, mom. Hey, you all right? Yeah, um, <laughs> would you believe it? I am totally lost again. I don't know where I am. If you look closely, his phone screen shows that he is not actually on a call. Mark confirms this happened two months prior as mom's death and Shiva was that inciting incident behind his recent struggle to keep Stephen at bay. Stephen helps Mark start to forgive himself. It wasn't your fault. And upon this, we return to another upside down overhead shot matching Stephen entering the museum in episode two as they join Tawarik oh. back on the deck as they approach the gates of Osiris. But the scales still have not balanced, so Mark's past victims crawl up from the sand. Mark punches one of their faces off, but he's still pushing back, even faceless. Stephen grabs a rudder to knock them off their balance, but then hits them with that bat. Prefer cricket. Yeah, six is what you yell when you've scored in cricket, but really just as Steven did as a kid with those spilled pencils, it's left to Steven to clean up Mark's messes. Steven makes the ultimate sacrifice, tackling the last one down into the sand, stranding him in the duat, bing bong style, all foreshadowed by that goddamn kid. And did it suck for you? Yeah. Getting rejected from the field of reeds? Well, that don't make sense, because I'm not dead, am I? Stevie. Am I? And so Steven turns into a sand sculpture, his last word being Mark, and his hand reaching out 
begin the same gesture and pose that Crawley freezes himself in. I truly hope that <sighs> Steven isn't gone forever. Yeah. Like if any ad or any higher power rules that Amit's premature condemnation of all those reigning souls was unjust, it's totally possible that Steven could be part of a divine retraction and could definitely rejoin his altars in the living world. We were asked on a live stream the other day if there were any movies that I really, really, really liked that I would never want to watch again. Inside Out was one of my two picks. Rec Room for a Dream and Inside Out. That scene in particular that he just mentioned was so heartbreaking. Yeah. It was like Pixar doing its thing where it's just taking it inside and like, <sighs> why are you doing this Pixar? Is this really necessary? I was crying, like miserably crying watching Inside Out. I'm, I must be a bitch. Like that movie just messed me up. I will never visit that film again, ever. And so he just showed, I'm just like, oh God. I needed a trigger warning for that one. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and again, I believe that Jake Lockley is still in that psych ward, and if Tuaret can make her case to Osiris, the best warrior of these three altars can take Harrow and Amit to the mat. But whether by tragic coincidence or because Mark no longer needs his Stephen altar to escape his trauma, those scales now finally balance, and Mark has moved to the Aru. It's an immediate and smooth transition, as if he was there the whole time, just waiting for that amber sunlight to beam through those purple clouds. Mm. Now earlier, Tuaret likened the underworld world to the ancestral plane. And this field of reeds definitely resembles a paradise where T'Challa's yeah. ancestors beckon him to join them. But with the sunlight and the tall plants, it also evokes the garden, Thanos' pastoral retirement. Mm. But ultimately for Mark, this is not a paradise. It is hell, because he knows he does not belong here. The music we hear is Masaya del Sol, sung by Manuel Bonilla and Santiago Stevenson, a Spanish hymn sung at funerals in Mexico and throughout Latin America, maybe oh. a nod to Oscar Isaac's Guatemalan and Cuban ancestry. But the lyrics translate to, beyond the sun, beyond the sun, I have a home home, beautiful home, meant to convey how in your present life you might be poor and lost, but in heaven, paradise awaits. Unfortunately for Mark, it is not the sun that he connects with, it's the moon. Actually, just as the opening shot of this episode cuts from something Mark feared to something he wanted, an abusive mother to an understanding mother, the closing shot now cuts the same way. From the sunny field of reeds, something he doesn't want, to the closing title card, that same field of reeds, but with the correct crescent moon shape oh. overseen it all. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. I really wow. liked that. I mean, I feel like this episode had so much that you could kind of dissect, whether it was, uh, you know, all of the mental health aspects and, and the emotional trauma, the abuse, all of that, um, as well as the connections to earlier episodes and, and stuff that's going on. Like, it, it's such a fun one to break down. I agree. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of in details. I think that I was mostly caught up in the emotional angle of that particular episode that I wasn't paying quite as much attention to. But you did see them when yeah. when we were watching. Sure. So, yeah, some know. of the ones that there were some that stood out to me, but I was mostly caught up in the emotional journey that Mark and Stephen were going on, and the, I guess the unification of their spirit, of their yeah. mind, whatever it might, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, I was kind of gut wrenching. It really was. Yeah, like I yeah. was I was having to hold back. So I, I was very happy to go through this because it allowed me to like really kind of reflect on some of the things that while I might have seen it just expanded on it because I was, like I said, it's just, whoa. <laughs> that episode was a lot of whoa. It hits you hard yeah. in, in the feels, that one. Because, yeah, yeah it, and especially Oscar Isaac's performance as mm -hmm. all the characters. Yeah. But it, it was just so incredible to watch. Like, how could you, even just in the, these little clips that they showed here, I was already feeling right. the stuff coming back up. I'm like, yeah. no. You guys, thanks so much for hanging out. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Please hit that bell icon, all notifications, and vote this up. Thank you again. I am Jabby Kawai. This is Achara Kirk. Peace out.